last night one of the worst yeah. nights you okay? yeah. of all time. No, I'm not okay. And what, what part of me seems okay? You've been around me this morning. Do I seem okay to you? You seem a little on edge. Yes, I'm a little yeah. on edge. I mean, it seems like you're forever on edge. I'm forever on edge. <laughs> I've been rooting for the race. Is there anything that gets you more on edge than the Jets? No. Oh. <laughs> the highs and lows. Last week. Right. It was great. This week, we got to get you to 10 o'clock. Yeah, last week we were good. And this week, uh, the coach should either be fired or potentially thrown in jail. Uh, with that, we welcome you back to Get Up, coming to you live from the reaction. Seaport District at Pier 17. We're brought to you by Chase. Roll the open. We are busy. Time to get up with Sam Darnold. He says he's seeing ghosts. That's a heck of a lot better than what the rest of us are seeing when we're watching them play. We're going in right off the top. Then, one might turn to Chicago to make oneself feel better and wonder, are the Bears ready to move on or at least make a move at quarterback. Graziano has that answer. And then Zion hurt again as the NBA season begins. Is there reason to worry this is a problem that isn't going away? All that and more in a jam-packed hour here on Get Up. And it doesn't even include this. Breaking news right before we came on the air this morning. Shefty reporting that the New England Patriots, after obliterating the Jets last night, traded for Mohamed Sanu this morning. They send a second-round pick to Atlanta for the very productive Falcons receiver. Feels like exactly what New England is missing. We'll talk at great length about it after we show you this, because I'm contractually obligated to. New England started the game with a 9-minute, 16-play drive for a touchdown. Then Sam Darnold came on the field, and it got worse. Second play for the Jets on offense. They put Le'Veon Bell out on top, and New England is going to bring what they did 10 times last night. Their cover zero blitz. Force the ball to Darnold's hands. McCourty can play with vision on the quarterback. Anticipate the ball coming out, and it's thrown right to him. That was McCourty's fifth interception of the season. Later in the quarter, Tom Brady, Philip Dorsett. That's a dime. Absolutely beautiful throw by Brady. An equally as good route by Dorsett. Nice stem. He got Tremaine Johnson's feet to set. And a good throw by Brady. Easy touchdown for New England. So at that point, it's 17-0. And then the Patriots defense just tees off. And, and Marcus... I mean, look at this. There's no one blocking John Simon no here. No question. And as this game continues to unveil itself, the New England Patriots and Bill Belichick says, we have this all night long. Sam Darnold was in a waltz nest last night. He was. He, he was just besieged all the time. Here's another one. You're going to see him throwing one up to no one in particular. That's a beautiful coverage change by the Patriots, though. They went from man to zone on the motion. Darnold anticipated that the safety would never be there, threw it right to him. He said on the broadcast, I'm seeing ghosts. Casper. And that was when I opened up the scotch. Uh, only it gets worse. 11 minutes left in the third now on a third down. Here's more. Yeah. Darnold, that's Stefan Gilmore with an interception. That's the third pick that he would throw. And now here comes another one. I feel bad for you reading this highlight, Greeny. Just the depression in your voice. Another interception by Darnold. This one's thrown off his back foot. Bad mechanics for him, and that's the process of first quarter ghost, second quarter ghost, third quarter ghost and pressure. Let's talk afterwards. Or not. <laughs> when I talk to the coaches, I just got to be, you know, straight up. And, you know, for me, um, I just got to see the field a lot better. That's kind of what that means. And, um, you know, just it was... It was a rough day out there. How were you guys able to rattle him? He, he said at one point on the ESPN broadcast that uh, I felt like he was seeing ghosts out Ooh, there. He did? Yeah. Oh, that's the man. Boogeyman. That's the boogeyman. It's real. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the kind of the continuity of your defense where up front you guys are putting Sorry, pressure. sorry. He really said that? Yeah. 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 Well, how were you guys able to rattle him for that's, him to see ghosts? That's crazy for him to say that. It is. That makes it real. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's so funny. That's so funny that he's saying that. Look how happy Kyle Van Noy seems to be about last night and the humiliation that they labeled on the Jets. And look, Sam Darnold was bad last night. There's no question about it. Bill Belichick has made young quarterbacks look bad for a very long time. But last night, to me, as a lifelong fan of this team, was much more about the coach than it was about anything else. I was willing to give Adam Gase a pass through the two weeks of non-existence that was the Luke Falk era because I figured maybe no one could coach that. But last Last night was one of the worst coaching performances I've ever seen in my life. Because all I am is a fan, and I can see he's not helping Sam Darnold out there. You guys are experts, and you can explain how. But when your young quarterback, around whom you are building an entire franchise, is saying on national television, I'm seeing ghosts out there, and you still have him out there, down 33 nothing against the Patriots and Bill Belichick, in my opinion, and I'm not kidding when I say this, there was a one-and-done coach in the NFL last year in Arizona, and I believe Adam Gase is going to be the same with the Jets this year. That was an embarrassing performance. 
performance in every way. You're here's, waving the white flag. First of all, is, um, gee, you just waved the white flag. Here's, wow. here's the issue I, I kept have my with language it clean. when it comes to Adam Gase, right? You're going into a game when you know New England does one thing, something incredibly well, right? That is their, their blitz package. Your number one job as the coach in that situation is to make sure you don't expose your quarterback to those situations. That it's not just the simple answers that you would run against the Cardinals or the Giants or whatnot that might have a blitz package. This is a very specific blitz package. And it's your job to give him answers. Now, at the same time, this is not the first quarterback that has struggled against this type of blitz package. We saw Patrick Mahomes struggle against this zero package just last year. But the difference was Andy Reid gave Mahomes way more answers to at least have the chance with the football, where Adam Gase never gave Sam Darnold the, hey, if you see this, just get to this play and make sure nothing bad happens with the football. Dez, they getting paid for this. Yeah. These dudes, <laughs> like, that, that's all I could think when I was watching the game. Yeah. I said Adam Gase – is making four times the money I'm making to do this yeah. to this young kid. <laughs> like you look at the, you yeah. look at this game, man, and for as much as I, I think the common fan, honestly, could look at that game and say, this is not Sam Dornell's fault. Right? If you have any England about football and the way it's supposed to go, yeah. give him an answer. Yeah. Just one I, that's all I was waiting on last night. Give Sam Dornell one answer. Even yeah. if it's the answers that even if it's an answer that doesn't <laughs> gut the right, base, right. Just make sure even, you play. Dan, from a even in that I, I don't know what it. answers you guys are looking for. Because when you look at Sam Dornell, don't forget when he was at USC, his last year there, he led all power five quarterbacks in turnovers with 22. When they were bringing him in for interviews, they were saying things like, oh, we know he'll fix it at the next level. How are you going to fix turnovers at the next level when you're playing against better athletes with much more complex schemes? I don't get it. So why did they draft him so high and now you expect him to go out there against Bill Belichick and that group and perform at a high level? People are putting a lot of pressure on Gates. I understand that. You're doing hey, your mental condition today? Yes. You're doing an extraordinary job. Thank I give you. you credit for that. Thank but you. listen, this man was a turnover machine at USC. Yeah, yes. but as we've it seen, we've seen, we've seen quarterbacks, we've seen quarterbacks be turnover machines in college football and change. Like Matt Ryan was a turnover machine in college football. He's been a great NFL we, player. We, Drew Brees was we, a turnover we, machine. This man led like, the, he led all power five quarterbacks. And how the quarterbacks at USC do you know what I mean? Dez, huh? we, we, how we seven USC days removed from him gutting the Cowboys. They, they, they're going through three. Like, they, they can't keep them healthy. We are seven days beat up. That's how they're doing now. But we seven days removed from Sam Dorn gutting the Dallas Cowboys. Yeah. Gutting them. I'm talking about looking at this kid like, what you call that? Oh, outlier? This is why they, That's like this an outlier, why, right? Well, <laughs> and let's, man, let's, give him a back or something in the flat. Let me regather. So, so, so both can be true. Yeah. Sam Darnold has shown flashes of having extraordinary talent. Exactly. He did turn the ball over too much they in college, that. and yeah. that has come over here. He has played a total of 16 NFL games, and he left two years of college on the table as well. Absolutely. So there's still a lot of time hopefully for him to figure it out with a different coach. Yep. Let me then get to the other piece of the conversation this morning, <laughs> which is Mohamed Sanu. Mm. The Patriots not only are 7-0 and with a defense that looks historically good, but they just added a piece that all of you have described this morning, so I'll, go, I'll start with you, as exactly the one thing they were missing. Gee, let me take you in the major black community right now. You ever played the game of spades? You ever played spades? Yes. Uh -huh. Card game spades? <laughs> this is like when you already have like seven spades in your hand, uh. And then you get the Joker. Wow. And it's like, yo, <laughs> what the hell am I supposed to do with that? We all trying to compete. The game yeah. is called spades and you got all the spades. Exactly. That's what Bill Belichick is operating like. How many bucks like. you going to make? Oh, I'm this is a Boston. I'm getting the whole 13 of them. <laughs> when we start talking about the move, here's the thing that people forget. Bill Belichick is the GM for this football team as well. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have a guy that's in-game evaluating what they need to be as a football team, every single day he's looking at talent, deficiency, and saying this is what we need to do in order to win a Super Bowl. Bill Belichick doesn't think on levels of winning his division. He doesn't think on levels of being in certain rounds of the playoffs. Right. Every move is structured to make it to the Super Bowl. 
Super Bowl. Muhammad Sanu is the piece they needed now, to get to the Super Bowl. Remember when we had Tom Brady's da dad on the show last yeah, year? And sure. You asked him, like, hey, how far in advance do you guys think about Super Bowl plans and booking your flights? And he gave the politically correct answer. What? Right, right. He was on Expedia last night, like, <laughs> or this morning after this trade, like, yeah, we're going. Where is it, Miami this year? <laughs> he booked his trip. Listen, I mean, I, we can joke around all we want. The Patriots are about as, right now, in, in an AFC that is decidedly down, look to be about as prohibitive a favorite as yes. I can remember having in either conference in football in a really long time. Let's put their schedule on the screen. They're favored in every single game the rest of the way. I think the conversation about the possibility of them going unbeaten comes into play right now. Yeah, that's legit. And I want everyone to realize, going back to Mo, Mo Sanu real quick, Mo, Mo Sanu is a one. He's a one receiver. He was just playing, he playing next to Julio, right? right? Like, Mohamed time, Sanu is a bona fide one. The Patriots, who are, are dominant right now, got not better, significantly better this morning with that so trade. So, that's where we begin this hour. The Patriots are unbelievable. The Jets are an embarrassment. And, Al, I'm asking you to talk about literally anything else. I got your back, Greeny. Let's run the hurry up. Drew Brees planning on returning to practice this week. Dan Graziano, what are the chances it'll start Sunday? There is a chance because he wants to and he has a lot of pull there, but they have to see him practice, how that thumb is holding up. He's still got a splint on it. His plan is to practice tomorrow, see how it feels the next couple of days, and then make a decision whether he can be on the field for that game against Arizona. More injuries. Andy Reid called it a stretch for Patrick Mahomes to be ready to play Sunday against the Patriots. So what's the latest there, Graz? Definitely a stretch but the Chiefs are very encouraged about the news they got from that MRI on Friday. They believe they will have Patrick Mahomes back sooner rather than later. Everything we've heard is saying it's a couple weeks, three weeks, a stretch for this week for sure, but definitely not a prolonged absence for Patrick Mahomes. And lastly, Graz man, Mr. Trubisky's not hurt. He's just not good. Is there any chance the Bears would bench him in favor of Chase Daniel? From what I'm told, not this week, but obviously, you know, as the season continues to go, these questions will continue to be asked as Trubisky continues to struggle. He's got a lot to work on. I've talked to some of his coaches, some members of that staff about what he needs to work on. It doesn't sound like he's right about to turn the corner. So they have a big project there in Chicago. If they don't, Benjamin, it would certainly buck the trend because Trubisky owns the third worst total QBR this season. And if you see the only other two guys that are worse than him, Josh Rosen and Marcus Mariota, they've both been benched. This is after a 2018 season in which Trubisky had the third best total QBR behind only Patrick Mahomes and Drew Brees. What happened? Here's his head coach, Matt Nagy. I know we need to run the ball more. I'm not an idiot. You know, I, I realize that. And uh, seven rushes and, you know, the, the, the minimum amount of times, that I totally understand that. We need to do it. You know, I'm not – I never go into a game saying I want to throw the ball 54 times. You know, I would love to go into a game and say I want to run the ball 54 times. But that just – that hasn't happened. Um, so, you know, that, that's what – this is what I have to answer to. I know we need to. Isn't he, what, what, what do you? He's, isn't he the play caller? I'm just very confused by. Well, um, they, they getting paid. They he's getting paid. Disassociating himself. They getting paid. I, I've got a lot of issues with this comment because this was not a game that got out of hand. Because sometimes that happens, right? Sometimes you go down 14 nothing, 17 nothing, and you take your game plan and you rip it up and you go, okay, well that's out the window. This is a 12-10 ball game at halftime. This is a game where they in that two-point game ran the ball five times in the first half, threw it 23 with a quarterback that was coming off of a dislocated shoulder and a labrum tear. There, there's, it's inexplainable to go, well, I really wanted to run the ball. You were in a game where the situation would dictate running the football. It was a two-point ball game at halftime, yet you're still throwing it 23 times with a quarterback that right now has no confidence. He's averaging eight yards per completion. That is the worst number in the history of the NFL right now. So game situation didn't dictate lack of running. Players' health didn't dictate lack of running. Players' performance or confidence level did not dictate the lack of runs. So as a play caller, you can't sit there and just go, well, I really wanted to. <laughs> if you wanted to, you would have. And that, I've got real issues with that for a young quarterback. What do you think that says about Matt Nagy then? Self-awareness is a big key to life right now. Like, I mean, look, it's so disappointing. We just got done with this conversation about Adam Gase. 
And now we got Matt Nagy. We got these young coaches that everybody think are these offensive minds and they prolific. They're supposed to put these young quarterbacks in a great position. It ain't that easy. And you know what else I'm starting to see with the Chicago Bears? I'm starting to see a defense become dejected. Sure. Like being on the field a lot. I've been in that situation before. Now, fortunately, I played with a really good quarterback who at least you felt like you had hope when he was in the game in Tony Romo. But I know what this mindset starts to creep. Right, we looking at Mitch Trubisky and we saying to ourselves, if I'm on that side, I'm like, damn, we're going to be out here for 90 plays today. And but then why right? did you throw the ball 23 times? But, but that's then. my point, Dan. That's my point. So you look at Nagy, you look at Mitch, and then you start to look at this defense who we highly touted, and now you're getting into that gray area. Just as the defense is is getting exasperated, the coaching staff feels like they're flat-footed because they believed this young man would take a jump this year that he has not taken. I talked to members of their coaching staff before he was hurt, mm-hmm. and the stuff they were saying, Mark Helfrich, the offensive coordinator, told me the difference between anticipation and predetermination is Trubisky's problem right now, that he He's assuming his first and second read won't be open, so he's locked in on the third, and his feet aren't set when the first one's open. I mean, that sounds like a pretty big project, right? I sure. mean, like that, that's yeah. a lot to fix there. And this is year three with a quarterback that was supposed to be blossoming by now, and he isn't. They can't trust him, and I think that's affecting everything. Did, did, and, yeah. now, and now Twitter. That's the point. But, and now Twitter, what, uh, now Twitter is undefeated at wanting to give someone else that job because there is an MVP guy that could potentially be lingering in bench, that being Cam Newton. Is there any chance that we're going to see Cam Newton? And make his way to Chicago. I like that question. Any chance? I always say, you know, I'd say, oh, there was always a chance. Oh, no, I don't. I don't think the Carolina that. Panthers are in the frame of mind to move Cam Newton right now. They have Kyle Allen playing well. They love Cam Newton. He's their franchise icon. I, I believe at some point he'll play for them again, and I think it'll be this year. Okay. So while the Bear season is in turmoil. Greeny, it's almost as if everything is still ahead of the folks in the NBA, of course, except the Pelicans. Yeah, the season starts tonight, and it starts without Zion Williamson. The Pelicans open, but Zion's expected to miss six to eight weeks after undergoing arthroscopic surgery yesterday to address a torn lateral meniscus in his right knee. Over his first four games in the preseason, he was unbelievable. Averaged over 23 points and six and a half rebounds and was shooting 71% from the floor. And he looked very much like the Zion that we saw in college. But the problem is... This is a guy who now got hurt at Duke, and he got hurt in Summer League, and he got hurt in the preseason, and he's going to miss the first two months of his rookie year. And you just look at the frame yep. and the explosive list uh, with, with which he plays, and you say to yourself, is this always going to be a problem? It's, it's a major concern. He is the same size as big baby Glenn Davis, but three inches shorter. He's the third heaviest player in the NBA behind Boban and Taco Fall. Both those players are over three, over 7'3". And actually, you know, we're going to show highlights, but he's knock knee, Greeny. Yeah. He's knock knee. I don't know if we can have the camera on me so I can show you. So, you know, the fact he's torn his meniscus, his meniscus, he's knock knee. He walks like this. So when he jumps, all that weight comes internally. It comes on inside, and that's where your meniscus is. So you hope that if, even if he does shed 20 pounds, and that's not a frame that's built for sustaining throughout an 82-game season. If, if you look at Zion Williamson, he plays like Michael Jordan, but he's built like Charles Barkley. Th- those are v- enormous generalizations, but it's the basic point, and it's why going back to last year, you and I have been having this conversation. Yes. You had to take him, number one, and you hope to God that he winds up staying healthy because he looks so good, but this will always be a concern. And his skill set doesn't lend to him not getting hurt. He's always attacking the rim with reckless abandon, and that that's congested your landing zone, and that's what happened with his injury. Look, let us be wrong. We have never wanted to be wrong. Greeny, yes. We have never wanted to be more wrong never about anything in yes. our lives. Okay, so with the season starting tonight, Jay Will has put together three bold predictions for okay. this NBA year, and it starts with a different superstar in the East. It does. The reason why the Philadelphia 76ers don't have a top duo is because Ben Simmons has not arrived all the way yet. So here's my bold prediction. Ben Simmons will finish this season in the MVP conversation. I've seen the jump shot this summer. I've talked to his trainer, Chris Johnson. He assures me that this is a confidence level for Ben Simmons. I think they are going to dominate the East. He will be in the conversation, Green. Okay, if he can shoot the ball, he becomes a very scary player. All right, let's go out west now. Everyone is looking at L.A. What are you saying? The Lakers and the Clippers will not win the Western Conference. I have the Rockets. Utah or Denver that will win the Western Conference. Low management with the Clippers. What are you going to do with Kawhi? Paul George, the injury to the shoulder. I think LeBron James and AD start off strong. I think Frank Vogel kind of limits their playing time as you get to the regular end of regular season, allow them to be rested for the playoffs. To be clear, you're talking about not finishing with the number one seed yes. in the West, not necessarily not coming out. Yes. Finally, 
Let's go to the team that has made it to the NBA Finals every year in recent memory. I've been saying this. People call me crazy. That's fine. The Warriors will not make the playoffs. They are the. They have the fourth. Bobby Marks just tweeted this out. They have the fourth youngest roster in the NBA. The fourth youngest roster. Now, Stephen Curry is tremendous. I think he'll have an MVP-type caliber year. But still, is D'Lo going to carry the load? Having him and Stephen Curry on the court at the same time makes him a defensive liability. Draymond Green, they need him to score more. They started their lineup the other day, Glenn Robinson the third and Marquise Chris. I mean, that's a very young team in the loaded West. What one of the big questions about them will be Clay Thompson, how soon he can come back and how effectively he yes. can come back. And look, the West is so you're loaded. Talking February, March, that's a big thing. Well, look, we brought this up earlier, the disparity in the power between the two conferences. If you put Golden State in the East, they have a chance. If, if Clay Thompson were to come back healthy oh, yeah. in February, they could finish with one of the top four seeds in the Eastern Conference. In the West, they will, I agree with you, they will likely miss the playoffs. Because I think Klay Thompson will come back. The question is, will he find that stride right away? And I, I think after he come off a torn ACL, it takes a while to find that confidence. What eventually happens is they flip D'Angelo Russell for the piece that winds up working better in that group. Andre and the Godala. next year, the year like? after this yep. one, they're right back Andre. where they were. All right, as we continue on Get Up on a very busy morning, the impact of Tua's injury on the race for the SEC is potentially enormous. Is Bama no longer the favorite? We'll ask our analysts in-house. And has Jerry already made up his mind about Jason's future in Big D? Wait until you see what he has to say about his head coach now. All that and more as we get up with you on ESPN.